Um, so my speciality as an advocate is medical negligence law. Um, I act mainly for hospitals, doctors and paramedics. Uh, my clients include states, um, state hospitals, state nurses, state doctors, um, and then also some of the privates, including in particular ER24. I do a lot of work for uh, Netcare, Mediclinic and the like. So we're going to talk a little bit today about emergency medicine and the law. And in particular, what we're seeing is a massive increase in litigation. I was recently in Johannesburg in the High Court and we were told there that the High Court in, in Joburg and Pretoria have separated their case streams. There's normal litigation and then there are three areas of litigation that have been separated out because of the enormous increase. And those three are the road accident fund cases, quite interestingly Prasa and the railways, and then lastly and the biggest increase medical negligence claims and that has been separated out into its own stream um, to manage the amount of litigation that's coming into court. So the question is why? Why are we seeing this massive increase in um, medical negligence and litigation in particular? So one option is that people are expecting more from healthcare providers. We're finding on the stats that's not the case. Another theory is the middle class is getting larger and is getting more access to legal advice. That's also not, uh, I don't believe, the case. Standards have dropped and you guys are messing up more than usual. <laughs> don't think that's the case either. Courts are more willing to grant large claims. We're looking at the claims and they're not increasing generally. Our courts are conservative and people are, are not getting more money than they would have got before generally obviously having regard to inflation and the diminution of the value of money. So we don't think that those are, are the reasons. What, what we think are the reasons are firstly this. Doctors, medics, nurses are no longer gods. There's an understanding out there that actually you can mess up and you can be sued. Um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that wasn't really the case. If the doctor made some kind of error, you just tended to live with it. There's greater access to the courts. So since we've become a constitutional democracy and people have come to understand their rights, there's also been with that a greater access to courts. And of course, lawyers, we're always very quick to get on the bandwagon with that and make as much money as we can. Um, and linked to that is probably, and I don't think I'm being cynical when I say this, I think that linked to that is the advent of ambulance chases in the medical negligence field. So what we saw for the last 20 years was lawyers arriving at hospitals looking for people who'd been involved in motor vehicle accidents, giving them their card and saying, you can sue the road accident fund. When you come out of hospital, come and talk to me. The road accident fund is now bankrupt. That litigation is drying up. Um, they've gone to mediation. It's not going into the high court as much. A large number of firms are finding that they don't have the road accident work that they had before. We are now seeing ambulance chasers arriving in the hospitals, handing out their cards, saying, if your baby has any kind of problem, come and talk to us afterwards. So literally just about every CP baby that is being born in this country, those parents are getting a card from a lawyer somewhere. Um, so there's much more awareness and there's much more access to legal advice and attorneys are increasingly prepared to act on contingency. So I win, I mark my fee for you, often double, double the fee that I'm entitled to. If I lose, then you walk away without having to pay my legal costs. That kind of contingency fee arrangement is very prevalent in medical negligence work. You would have seen on television, there are a whole bunch of firms who go so far as to advertise on television. Have you been injured? Have, are you unhappy with the medical care that you've got? Come and talk to us and we will help you. What's important, I think, though, to realize is that this is not changing the way that the courts are looking at your conduct. It's not changing the law. It's more prevalent. The cases are more prevalent, but it's not changing anything. So the principles remain the same. And we are a conservative legal system. So the test that will be applied to you, whether you are a doctor, a medic, a nurse, a first aider, whoever you are, have you conducted yourself in the manner that would be expected of a reasonable emergency care practitioner with your same qualifications 
in the same circumstances. And we're just briefly going to look at the three elements of that to give you some understanding of it. A reasonable emergency care practitioner of your qualifications in those circumstances. Those are the three elements that will be looked at by the court. So the first one, the reasonable emergency care practitioner. I'm going to tell you very briefly the case of the paramedic and the dangerous jump bag. We heard about situational awareness um, from, from one of the doctors who was talking now. So, case that I have on my desk at the moment, ambulance, Cape Flats, ladies had a heart attack, very elderly lady, they arrive on the scene, they stabilize her, they get her on the stretcher, they bring her down. She has a series of friends who are frail and elderly as well. They're terribly upset by her friend who's had a heart attack, so they gather around. They want to be part of it, they want to hold her hand, they want to tell her it's going to be okay. They come down the stairs of the you know, typical three-story Cape Flats, Hanover Park, they arrive at the ambulance, they're still very distressed, the one elderly lady is particularly distressed, she won't leave her friend alone, and our paramedic is closing the ambulance door and turns around with his jump bag, hits her and sends her fly flying. And she's injured and now she's complaining and may, may sue for, for injuries. Situational awareness, is that paramedic right or wrong? That's something that the court is going to have to decide at some point. Was it reasonable or not reasonable? Personally, I think it's an entirely defensible claim. And I should have kept out of the way and, and been aware herself of the situation. Will the court see it the same way? I, I can't tell you yet. But that's an example of the courts will then look at that situation and say, is that reasonable? Did that paramedic have situational awareness? Did that medic, was that a medic aware? Had he cleared the scene sufficiently? How had he dealt with the situation around him? A tricky one, another case on my desk. This is up north. Middle of the Orange Free State, it's the middle of winter, it's two o'clock in the morning. Massive car accident. First on the scene is an ambulance with, an, with a BLS in it. They actually happened to be going past the scene and, and weren't intending to go to that scene at all. BLS gets out, she's got nine injured people in the pitch dark of the Orange Free State, it's minus three degrees. Various injuries, patients scattered across the felt. She's got to make an immediate triage on who she needs to treat and who she doesn't. So she runs from one to the other. Some she, in fact, one patient she didn't find at all, but it's pitch dark. But she finds the patients, and one of them she gets to looks like very serious injuries, looks like they're exsanguinated. She puts on a, on a finger probe, she gets no sats, she gets no blood, uh, she gets no pulse. She makes a decision that she's going to leave that patient alone and that patient's deceased and she moves on to the next one. An hour later, the scene has been lit up, so the tow truck drivers are there, the other ambulance is there, and an ALS arrives. The ALS is, surveys the scene, some patients have been already treated, some haven't. The BLS tells the ALS, those two are deceased, these, this, and she does a handover. The ALS accepts that those two are deceased, declares those two deceased. She wakes up in the morgue. She's not a happy lady. <laughs> <laughs> to, put it, to put it mildly. <laughs> so what, what's the court going to do with that scenario? The court's probably going to say to the BLS, you're only a BLS, you've got a hell of a difficult situation on your hands, you did a triage, maybe you got it wrong, maybe you got it right, you're off the hook. What's the court going to say to the ALS? Ah, tricky. Your scene is calmer now, you're an ALS, you've got 15 years experience, yeah, maybe you should have done a little bit more before you carted her off in the mortuary van, which is a very unpleasant place to be if you're still alive. Um, so, so what are your qualifications? I've I've got a level three first aid. That's a very low qualification. I've been a cop for 20 years. So I've done hundreds of horrendous accident, gunshot, stabbing, you name it. How am I going to be judged? How is the bystander who thinks they know a bit of first aid but doesn't really and watched a movie once about it and starts to get stuck in, how are they going to be judged? How are you going to be judged? What are your qualifications? You're an ALS but you've been an ALS for a month. So it's quite, it's quite a, it's a, a, a nuanced and fluid um, assessment of who are you and what is expected of you. 
and you will be judged against a reasonable practitioner of the same qualifications and experience as, as you have. And then in the circumstances, so that orange free state motor vehicle accident, the circumstances were difficult, it was cold, it was dark, um, and sh she was effectively on her own with, a, with another BLS driver. Case of the trap minor was on my desk at the moment, up north. There's a crush injury at, I can't even remember, it was something like two kilometers underground, something horrendous. Um, a miner is crushed, his vehicle, which is an automated vehicle, um, gets out of control, it crushes him very badly against the wall. He's there for, we don't know how long, because his radio doesn't work. So we think that he's down there, crushed on his own for about two to three hours. Eventually, emergency care gets to him, and our paramedic and ALS gets to him. Now we know with a, with a crush injury, there are issues about resuscitation, and you've got to try and resuscitate if you can, the moment you release that crush, because otherwise you're gonna run into trouble. It's pitch dark. For some reason, this mine's lighting system doesn't work and they're all using little headlights. It's very narrow. Our paramedic has burst his eardrums as he's gone down because they've dropped him down in the lift so far. So he's disoriented himself. This is not a place he wants to be. And he makes a decision that we've got to release this guy from the crush and we've got to move him to a better, lit, more stable, easier to work place which he then does. It takes about 10 minutes to get him to a place that is well lit and that he can actually work. The guy at that stage is completely critical and he dies about half an hour later. There's a mine inquiry into that paramedic's conduct as well as the mine's safety issues. The issue that will come up there is those circumstances. What can be expected of a paramedic in those circumstances? Um, that will be treated differently to whether it's you treating that crush injury above ground during the day in a well-lit area or whether the person has got to hospital, got to a clinic, or is in the back of the ambulance. So the circumstances are important. You're not going to be judged on the same standard for every situation. As I said at the beginning, it's, it's important also to note that we're a conservative legal system. So we have seen, we know from in, in America, there are concerns about, there was a reference to Good Samaritan law. There are concerns about people not wanting to become involved in an emergency care situation because perhaps you do something wrong, you end up being sued for millions. We're a more conservative system. Again, you're going to be judged if you choose, choose to get involved. You will be judged according to your qualifications, um, according to the, the reasonable person in your circumstances. But the kind of monetary awards that are being made are not big. So we have, just very briefly to explain to you, we have a system where if you injure me, let's say um, one of you attack me because you're so annoyed by me, and you render me paraplegic or you render me in a vegetative state so I can't work anymore, my claims will be for loss of income, my claims will be for my medical expenses, so those are actual money. So I've got to actually prove that I've lost that money. And then I will get what's called general damages. Now in America, that's where the big money comes in. The lady, no, it was a gentleman, who bought the hot coffee at uh, McDonald's and then it spilt in his lap and burned his groin. Um, unbelievably, he sued and won. Um, he got, I can't even remember, but it was something extraordinary, like 10 million US dollars for his pain and suffering for his hot coffee and his groin. Um, in, in this country, the highest award for general damages in a medical negligence case we have at the moment is 1.2 million. And that is a child who will spend the rest of their lives in a, in a very severe spastic CP condition. Uh, that's the maximum award we've had. So if you break your leg, you're gonna get about 100,000 general damages. And so that's the kind of, that's the, that's the realm of it. That's the ambit of it. So we're not talking enormous monetary awards as you are elsewhere. It, the aim of the, of, of the law is to compensate you properly for what you've actually lost. Okay, in terms of given this huge um, exponential rise in litigation, what does the future look like for us? Again, that's a 
photo I worked in Masi for Malela, that's a photograph I took in, in, in Masi. That's just an indication, I mean, you've all seen it, you all know it. This is the kind of poverty that we are facing, and we're going to have to balance the needs of people who live in those kinds of conditions with your resources, your abilities, and your rights, and let's not forget your rights as well. My son is just doing the first year of uh, emergency care um, practitioner at uh, CPUT, and he's been doing his shifts, and one of his, and Myers, his father, greatest fears is that something is gonna happen to them as an ambulance crew. It's real, it's happening, you all know about it, the red zones. So there's gonna be a balancing of, of who you are, of what you can do, what you can't do, what you bring to the party against the ever-growing needs of a population that is exploding and a socioeconomic divide that is only getting worse. All I can say to you is stick to what you know, stick to your professional standards, don't let them slip. Make sure that you're being reasonable at all times. Um, try not to have front-end accidents <laughs> where you're the first on the scene because you caused the accident. Um, and, and the courts will protect you. This is not a hunting exercise where you are being hunted for doing good things. The courts will protect you. If you've done your job as best you can, applied all the kinds of rules, applied your training, been reasonable, thought about it, and made a mistake, that's fine. We all make mistakes. Just on making mistakes, maybe just one last point. Um, you were spoken to by an anaesthetist. One of the most important recent court cases in the last 20 years around this kind of thing was an anaesthetist. He was the anaesthetist in, I think it was a hysterectomy. And the lady went um, hypervolemic, hyper, um, hypertensive, hypotensive, and she went into an arrhythmia, and they needed to shock her, and he grabbed a shock device, and the battery didn't work. And he froze, and he's a very experienced anaesthetist, and he froze. He just, he'd never contemplated the thought that the machine's battery might have gone flat. There was a lot of evidence given by nurses and everybody about how long he froze for. But he probably froze for 40 seconds to a minute of just doing nothing, just standing there in complete amazement. And the court found that that's reasonable, that he's not a god, he can be expected to be shocked, he can be expected to be surprised, he can be expected to freeze, we're all human. It was an incredibly important finding to say you can't expect the unreasonable of ordinary human beings. So, stick to your standards, do what you do, because what you do matters. And enjoy being an emergency care practitioner. <laughs> Thank you very much.